So, welcome, um, remaining people. <laughs> we start with the session four, last but not least. Um, our main topic is human rights, ethics, and technology. Um, we have four speakers, maybe three. <laughs> four? Okay, four. <laughs> All right. Um, I just want to start with two pictures um, to speak about the relationship between human rights, ethics, and technology, especially AI. Um, I just wanted to show you um, what is AI without ethics, without principles, um, and that's maybe a prominent example of uh, Tay, uh, social bots of Microsoft, uh, which learned from other conversations from the internet and turned into a um, racist. Um, uh, you can you can read the comments, of course, um, and. A second picture, which is not such drastic as Tay, maybe, but these are some examples from uh, Google, Google Translator. Um, if you type in um, things like CEO or lawyer or doctor into um, and want to translate all these words into um, languages such as German or French, you always get the um, you always get answers which indicate that all these people are men. Der Arzt, der Anwalt. It's the same thing in, in French. Yes, just, just try it. It's the same. Um, you get the same results, of, of, of course, um, in, in, in French. And um, I, I just wanted to show you um, what is AI without ethics, without principles, without law. Um, by showing these examples, I want to start our last panel. And today, um, we will change, uh, we will make a little change and start with Sarah, Sarah Eskens. Um, she's a PhD candidate at the Institute for Information, Information Law at the University of Amsterdam. Um, Sarah's research concerns online news personalization and the privacy um, and information rights of news users. Sarah, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm talking with this microphone. I hope it's working right now. Should be louder. Or I can, I can use the handheld one. Wait. I really wish I was an octopus, but um, I'm not, unfortunately. So thank you for the introduction, and thank you also to the IT Institute, uh, Law Institute, for inviting me. It's a really interesting uh, symposium, and I've met a lot of new faces and uh, heard about a lot of new perspectives on privacy and data protection questions. Um, so, as, uh, as you mentioned, I'm indeed a doctoral researcher at the Institute for Information Law, and in my doctoral research, I look at AI applications in online news media, in particular news recommender systems. Um, and then, because I'm a lawyer, of course, I look at the privacy and information rights of news consumers who use these uh, AI applications or recommender systems. Um, I started my PhD research in March 2016, and I'm expected to finish it um, uh, in May 2020. So what I want to do today is like talk a bit about some general observations and general conclusions of my PhD that I'm ex expecting to draw, and hopefully that will lead to some questions or discussions uh, later on in the Q&A. So first of all, um, just as a starter, when I'm talking about AI applications in news media, I'm mainly talking about uh, recommender systems that are being used to personalize for every individual user the, the news that they see um, when they browse online. So, for example, the New York Times, they launched a project in which uh, they're experimenting with uh, algorithms to give individual readers uh, a different news selection based on their clicks and their online behavior. Another famous example is, of course, Google News, uh, the BBC iPlay, so also public service media used it. There's also specific uh, dedicated apps such as News360 that aggregates news from different uh, news sources and then uses uh, your, your, your interest uh, to, or, and, and your preferences or the time of the day that you're reading the news or your commuting pattern uh, to give you uh, a selection of news articles each day that are specifically relevant for you. And 
always when I start to talk about news personalization, of course, one um, major concern or common concern is our, our filter bubbles. So filter bubbles is uh, the idea that the use of algorithms by news media and search engines leads to uh, people being locked up into some kind of isolated information bubbles. And uh, within these uh, information bubbles, they would not learn of other ideas and perspectives. And this then consequently could lead to polarization in society and uh, there would be a lack of a public sphere where people debate common political issues. So if I would frame this in human rights language, you could say that the privacy violations that occur with news personalization uh, could harm media pluralism and political participation, which are two core values that are embedded in the right to freedom of expression, another fundamental right. Um, however, uh, a lot of empirical research actually has shown that these filter bubble concerns are, are largely overblown. Sorry, I just now see a, um, a typo in my uh, slide. Um, and especially the concerns about filter bubbles when we look at the European context, which is the jurisdiction that I'm working in, um, are, not, are, 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 are quite overstated. So if we look in Europe, uh, we have a lot of public service media, uh, multi-party systems, and this kind of uh, 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 circumstances in different counties uh, usually ensure that people are uh, still informed on a wide diversity of issues. And also just the use of social media, which is often thought to create these kind of uh, filter bubbles, has actually shown to be uh, to, uh, enriching for, many, for most of the people. So when people use social media or Google search or uh, other news media that make use of uh, recommender systems, usually these people actually uh, consume more diverse news and f encounter more diverse information than people who don't. So, I don't want to talk about filter bubbles today, but, sorry, I'm just, right, puzzling a bit with my notes. Um, what I'm more concerned of is uh, two other things, and one of them is chilling effects. So, when I'm talking about chilling effects, this is a legal notion, but it's also being discussed in empirical research. Uh, chilling effects, as I understand it, is... Uh, what happens when a measure by a public or private actor has uh, the unintended effect that people refrain from exercising their freedom of expression rights out of fear for the consequences of doing so. And when I'm talking about freedom of expression rights in this context, I'm talking about the right to impart information, so really the expression part, but I'm also talking about the right to receive information and the right to hold opinions. And these three rights are all protected by European fundamental rights instruments, but also by the uh, United of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So it's not just about expressing yourself, but it's also about, or these concerns also relate to how people search for information online, or how they develop their uh, own thoughts. And, of, and, and these three rights that I just mentioned are also related to uh, another fundamental right, which is freedom of thought. Um, so an example of chilling effects and how that relates to freedom of expression rights would be, for example, when a government monitors internet traffic to catch terrorists, and people are aware of this internet monitoring, such as, uh, for example, what was disclosed by uh, the Edward Snowden revelations, then because people are concerned, people who are clearly not a terrorist might still be concerned that they leave a suspicious data trail uh, when they search for information online, and therefore, because of fear for leaving these suspicious data trails, they might not search for certain information or might not click on certain uh, uh, hyperlinks. So therefore, they would be uh, chilled in, the, in their exercise of uh, uh, the right to receive information. Or people might be chilled in expressing themselves online because it might look, ex look suspicious in the view of the government. Um, and on this notion of chilling effects, because uh, as a lawyer, even though I'm a lawyer, I work together uh, often with communication scientists and media scholars and journalism scholars. So I use a lot of these empirical insights in my, in my work. And uh, there have been various uh, empirical studies on chilling effects, among others by uh, Jonathan Penny and Elizabeth Stoichtjev. And they have, they, these studies indicate that indeed in different circumstances people might be um, might be refrained from exercising using the internet as freely as they would want to. Um, so, 
in the context of my own research, AI applications and online media, I think there is a risk that people fear to disclose that they have certain old or mundane interests, such as celebrity news or um, more, more, more uh, uh, interest in political conflicts that might be this yeah, might create uh, a certain image of them, and therefore, because they are fear, because they fear to disclose these specific interests, they might not read certain recommended content or might not search for extra information when they are presented with certain recommended content. So, um, there's the, there there is this risk of the chilling effect when people know that they their their behavior um, and their engagement with these systems is being monitored all the time. So again, framed in human rights terms, uh, when people are aware of the privacy violations that come with uh, the use of AI applications in online media, they might be restrained in exercising their freedom of expression rights. And here, in this connection between freedom of expression and privacy, that I find super interesting. And some uh, researchers, such as Julie Cohen or Neil Richards, have, t uh, have termed that the notion of intellectual privacy. So intellectual privacy is and I think that this also goes to a few concepts that uh, Judith discussed earlier. It's about a privacy that relates to how you gather information and how you form and develop your own original thinking. And I think this is a more, um, uh, uh, more prominent concern, at least for me, than the filter bubble concern in the, in the online media context. Another concern that I have is about personal self-development. So I just name, name these uh, few human rights that I'm interested in, privacy, data protection, freedom of expression, right to receive information, freedom of thought. And in all these fundamental rights, which you could see as kind of the information and communication rights, they all embody, embody the value of personal self-development. And again, this was also uh, highlighted by, uh, by, our, by our first keynote speaker. And these, these privacy and information rights uh, are about, among others at least, to uh, people being able to develop their own identity and to grow as a human being. So therefore, that picture. Um, and of course, freedom of expression is also about public debate and public participation, which are also the concerns that we see in the filter bubble uh, context. But in various cases of the European Court of Human Rights, for example, in the case of course, Kusit Mustafa and Tarsi Baki versus Sweden, which I will not discuss because of time issues, you see how the court is concerned about uh, people being able to receive the information that they want to receive because they want to connect to other people, because they want to belong to a certain group, and because they want to kind of exp express themselves through, um, uh, through receiving certain information and, and grow as human beings, and not just only to uh, uh, participate in political debates or whatever. So what I'm concerned about is that when these AI systems make these choices for us, uh, what we should read, then people have less agency over the, over the path that they, that they follow and how they develop and how they grow themselves. And furthermore, I'm also uh, concerned that if AI makes these choices, like people also express themselves through making certain choices about the, what they want to read. So by choosing what you want to read and what kind of information you're interested in, you also try to belong to certain social groups. And when these choices are taken away from you because they're all automated, then I think this does something very fundamental to how we uh, develop ourselves and grow as human beings. So one solution that I uh, think we could use in this context uh, is giving users more control. And I know that control these days is uh, a bit of a, uh, yeah, a hotly debated topic when we talk about it in specific data protection uh, language. But I think when we're looking at these um, concerns, if we give users more control over the way that they are being uh, represented uh, in these AI systems and, and how they're being profiled, then that could um, uh, address these chilling effects and these uh, risk for personal self-development. And to be clear, I'm not talking just about control in terms of consent. I'm talking about uh, control that is continuous, that is being um, constantly kind of checked. And I'm thinking about control in the sense of that you, for example, uh, as a user being asked, like, is this the way how you really want to be represented? Are we profiling you in a way that kind of reflects the image uh, that you have of yourself? 
And the GDPR, which has been uh, discussed a few times already today, provides a basis for such user control. So we have the right to erasure, we have the right to object, we have the right to rectification. And I think if you read these read rights together, you can see how people basically have a right uh, to control their online profiles and have a right to be involved in the creation of these profiles. Um, so one example, I think, how this could be implemented by uh, online media is if you serve someone a few personalized recommendations, you could just ask after a few times, is this really what you want? Um, or uh, allow people to have different kind of profiles that they can switch to if they want to perform different social roles. So one of my colleagues, who is an anthropologist, has actually been working with uh, focus groups, so groups of users, to think about these different personalities that we could use online to play with different, um, uh, yeah, different types of algorithms that also re represent you differently and that leads to different information choices for you. So that was the con conclusion of my talk, thank you. Uh, Sarah, thank you very much. Um, especially the close relationship between all these fundamental rights, um, data protection, right to personality, um, uh, and um, freedom of expression, of course. Very important topics. Thank you very much once again. And next we have Elif, Elif Sart. Um, she's a research affiliate at Berkman Klein Center um, and research at um, Bill University's IT Law Institute at the same time. She focuses on biometric recognition technologies, children, and AI. Thank you. And seriously, I cannot, I could have not thought of a better presentation before mine. You really set the stage perfectly. And you mentioned control, and you, you said that you have this like different idea of control when you mean control, and I do too. And I, I hope to express that. So uh, if my presentation does not already scream what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about surveillance and children. So brave new children in a brave new world. Um, what I'm going to walk you through is basically what is surveillance and facial recognition systems anyways? And why am I talking about children? Which I would not probably add this slide because throughout the day I'm so happy that we touched on children and how certain topics may be especially be critical for these vulnerable groups. And then I'm going to talk about examples of facial recognition systems used in a child's life. And then I'm going to move on to those examples harms. Uh, especially from the human rights perspective. And then the existing responses and the finally takeaways. So what is surveillance and facial recognition? So when you look into surveillance's definition in these two dictionaries, you really see that what they're looking for is a criminal or like a crime. And it is really interesting because surveillance is not just about crime or criminal. It can be parental surveillance or it could be surveillance just to change human behavior, so on and so forth. But I just want you to keep this definition in mind throughout my presentation. And t surveillance gets a bit more interesting when it gets, um, when these um, complicated technologies like facial recognition systems and par with them. And what is facial recognition systems? And I'm going to keep it very short. It's basically the technology that makes it possible for a computer to recognize someone's faces. It's that technology when you look at your phone, it unlocks your phone, or when you post something on social media accounts, uh, it t tags faces. Um, and why children? Well, I think this group has already uh, thought, had some time to think about why we're talking about children, but they're often overlooked, thankfully not in this room. Uh, they're mostly underestimated, especially when it comes to consent, and so many speakers touch on the notion of consent. Aicha mentioned that there are different age rates in different countries, and why so? Why do we think it differently? And then the future is children. And what we're doing today, what we're talking about today, is not going to affect us, maybe a little, but children mostly. So here are some examples of facial recognition systems used in a child's life. Okay, 
states, of course. Um, recently, NYPD uh, announced that they've been loading thousands of arrest photos of children and teenagers into a facial recognition database. And this is, this is really concerning, which I'm going to come back to that point, but this is a technology that has a higher risk on matching younger faces. So please keep that in mind. And then families, they bring toys, home robots into houses, which has uh, facial recognition capabilities. And then private companies, as I mentioned, once parents or acquaintances um, upload photos on social media platforms, then their nieces or nephews or children's face get tagged. And then recently we saw that Flickr's photo uh, database was being used to train uh, facial recognition algorithms, which by this like mega face, mega data set that gets used uh, to train machine learning. And then recently this summer, something was really popular in the States, uh, summer camps with facial recognition systems. Basically, parents were able to upload their children's photo on the system so that they could easily um, filter out their children's photos. But again, this was done by a facial recognition system used by these camps. And then schools. Schools use these systems mostly for security purposes, especially after uh, the, not bombing, but shooting events in different locations around the states. This technology has became kind of a hero. <laughs> And where schools uh, deploy this technology is mostly corridors, stadiums during uh, graduation ceremonies and so on. But things get a bit more complicated when they bring it to classrooms, which, which does not mean to say that corridors are not less creepy, they're creepy as well, but classrooms um, allow these technologies to detect emotions, attentions, and physical activities of children. So, possible harms. Of course, privacy is the most significant concept that might be violated by these systems. Because as Judith mentioned in, uh, during her keynote speech, this notion of privacy is related to our freedom, ability, this is an ability to express our individuality. But when you're nine or 13 years old and you see all these cameras all around and you feel like you're being constantly watched, what kind of an identity can we talk about there? Like wh how, how on earth are you supposed to be free and express yourself and test boundaries and social boundaries and your boundaries? So that's really problematic there. And we also mentioned the notion of consent and how this mechanism might not be the tool we're looking for. And some speakers uh, along with Judith said that GDPR is not going to change and that's the system we have and that's kind of spearheading what we have in the data protection laws. So consent it is, <laughs> and it is broken, we know that. But it, does, it should not stop us from asking critical questions. And at Berkman Klein Center, I'm leading this working group called Biometric Recognition Technologies. And for the last two months, we've been talking about children, which is really surprising, but I love it. And some of the questions we've been thinking about, we don't have clear answers, but questions, are these. To what extent should parents be able to consent to their kids' data collection? How, how much of a freedom they have in their choices? Do they, are they educated enough to understand consequences of their choices? Do, are they really familiar with these technologies or like business processes that these data is, um, data is used for? And then do they really understand long-term implication of this data collection? So this question list is of course not exclusive and we can make it into a long, long list, but I'm gonna keep it there. And privacy is, of course, not the only harm, since we're at a human, in a human rights panel. I'm not going to go explain these uh, concepts again, as um, you did an amazing job in this. So basically, one thing that I want to mention is freedom of expression. Um, 
is also undermined along with associ association and um, freedom to, I guess, be whoever you want to be. And why this is restricted? Because, like, as I mentioned, once you have all these cameras all around, what are you going to do? It's, it's just you're going to self-censor yourself. You're going you're gonna to start not doing things. You're going to change your behavior in a certain way. And then discrimination is another harm I want to mention. So even though there's a clear evidence that facial recognition systems has a higher risk of false matches on younger faces, New York Police Department use these photos. And this could especially uh, expose more children of color to the school to prison pipeline, since we know that there's an already discriminatory um, system we have in place. And Human Rights Watch argues that using inaccurate facial recognition systems in schools could perpetrate racial discrimination against people of color and perhaps expose more children of color to prison risk. And one thing that really struck me was um, to see that sometimes facial recognition technology is being used as the arbiter of truth, you know, like kids have a fight and they say, you knew you started it, and then the other one says, you started it. It's like, okay, let's check cameras. And in that case, if the facial recognition system tags it, the person in a false way, then are the teachers gonna listen to the facial recognition systems or the children? How are you gonna come into conclusion in that scenario? And then as I mentioned, there's low accuracy so really quick responses. So there are some legal responses to what's happening in this field. Uh, I'm just going to walk you through these. Some of them are just like banning the use of facial recognition systems. for, <laughs> And some of them include fines from data protection authorities, which happened in Sweden when they wanted to use facial recognition systems in classrooms to measure attention. And then another one is New York Assembly passed a bill that banned facial recognition technology in the state schools. And then we, we, we do not just see legal responses, but there are also social responses. For instance, those schools that started deploying facial recognition systems um, kind of pissed off the parents. They started protesting, children raised their voice, they're like, this is not what I wanted, you didn't ask me. And of course, rights activists in academia are raising their voice as well. And there is another thing I wanna mention, which is some responses in the technological field by these companies which deploy these technologies, they say that, oh, like, there are these principles, these schools or summer camps should um, apply in their systems, but there is no clear implementation mechanism. They don't have to do it, so it's not really effective. So my takeaways. So obviously facial recognition systems are a part of a trend of increasing surveillance despite a lack of firm evidence that more technology makes kids safer. But these systems normalize surveillance in a child life. And we did think about the concept of normalizing these technologies, but what we decide to normalize today will most likely be the future generation's only truth they live in, and this is scary. So we have a responsibility for the next generations. How do we take that responsibility? So I want you to leave this panel with more questions than answers. And here are some questions I want you to maybe think about and just leave today with these questions at least. And the first one is, is it okay to experiment with children when a technology is unknown at the first place? Because we do not know the lines. Where do we go with this? And then where, where do we draw the line? Should there be a line? Should there be a practice that we must not allow? Should we just say companies should not be able to collect biometric data of children? And then when, a cons when consent is not, not enough and why? Can we fix it? And in what situations society should step in in response to the possible harms and risks they see or experience? Or when the states should step in? How should they really? How do we think about social harm and social good? Thank you.
Thank you very much. Elif, um, once again, right to personality as a fundamental right, which reminds me of a famous decision of the German Federal Constitutional Court, uh, 1983, the year I was born. Um, the court uh, created a fundamental right um, to informational self-determination. And we are still discuss discussing children's rights, uh, people's rights. And um, having said that, I want to introduce, I, I, I think I don't have to introduce you. Um, <laughs> Mehmet Bedikaya will talk to you um, about, I'm sorry, Bedi, I'm sorry. <laughs> The correlation between internet law, data protection, and human rights. <laughs> you have the stage. Thank you so much. Good afternoon or good evening. I don't know which phrase should I uh, prefer. Uh, again, it's my pleasure and honor to appear before you. And I thank uh, to the, uh, Mr. Moderator for his kind introduction. So I would like to start with a different uh, method of uh, presentation. Uh, while I prepared, uh, prepared my presentation, I looked online to uh, word the concept of uh, mixed soup. and. Uh, I came up with uh, almost each country, each culture have its own mixed soup. They put whatever stuff is growing up within this region and they call it, this is our mixed soup, uh, and it makes sense for them. So my presentation will be a kind of uh, mixed soup. I will throw some topics. Uh, I will not connect the dots. Uh, most of them will be uh, stand uh, alone, stand independent. So I'm starting my very first uh, part uh, that I'm adding to this soup, hacking the law. And uh, I'm uh, giving you a very recent example. Can the law itself be hacked and circumvented? Yes, uh, there are rules for abuse of the law in different legal systems. says that if you abuse the system, uh, I will not grant you this particular right. And I will provide a concrete example, a recent example, in terms of data protection and privacy. There is a game com company, I will not say the name, uh, they have disqualified a uh, participant uh, of a contest on the grounds of that this particular uh, gamer uh, publicly provided comments uh, for Hong Kong protests. At the end of the day, there was outrage, outcry uh, for this action, and people all around the world, net citizens, netizens, started to question how can we punish this particular company, and a group of people came up with the idea. This company is subject to GDPR in, for certain areas. Let's start uh, ask uh, for our data. So, hundreds, perhaps thousands of people starting filing requests for their personal data without a valid grant. And then this has created an outrage at the company because they got a kind of uh, DDoS, uh, denial of service attack. Uh, they got bombed about these GDPR requests. And at the end of the, the uh, day, after having like thousands of requests uh, and you know, they should comply with them uh, uh, in a certain period, then they apologi uh, uh, apologized and said, we are sorry. So this is any kind of uh, human rights activism. Uh, and you know the words netizens, people all around the world are gathering and using an instrument laid down for a distinct purpose, use them for human rights activism, and I call this particular case as hacking the law. I'm moving to another case. Uh, you can imagine my soup, I'm adding whatever I find uh, interesting. Uh, and today in the menu we have another example, uh, hacking for a really distinct purpose. 
when we talk about hacking, why people hack someone else, there are different kind of motivations. When you read cyber security reports or this kind of taxonomy, you can see that it could be money, it could be revenge, or it could be just for fun. And now uh, we see intelligence reports coming from uh, underground uh, websites. The motivation for hacking is also changing. There was a group of hackers. They uh, uh, declared that they are just hacking for that company to get GDPR fine. So it's another uh, interesting uh, aspect, uh, using an illegal action to uh, you, uh, promote, uh, uh, to use as a leverage for a legal uh, uh, discourse. So this is also uh, changing the discourse using tools uh, for, uh, that has been laid down for a special purpose, a distinct purpose, using them uh, for a very distinct area. I'm moving. Again, I say that it's soup, so there will not, I will not connect the dots. I'm moving to another uh, area, because my topic is correlation. It's totally, I will leave the uh, correlation, uh, the establishing the correlation to you. Uh, data protection, culture, and history, they are also interacting. Uh, when we talk about data protection, there's a general saying uh, which says that, which states that, articulates that, United States doesn't have data protection law. Yes, they don't have a federal law, but they have very unique, interesting uh, privacy uh, regulations. For instance, they have their Employee Polygraph Protection Act. This is a very special act. This act, for instance, prohibits employees to uh, uh, deploy uh, lie detectors within their employment or pre-employment processes. So it's a very unique uh, law legislation that has been laid down as a response uh, for a certain historical action. Another example is video privacy, I'm sorry, action of 1988. This also an interesting case, interesting piece of legislation. This uh, legislation prohibits the use of rental history uh, for uh, specific purposes. Uh, there has been a case, uh, within this case, uh, as an evidence, the rental history has been uh, attempted to be used as an evidence. Then we had a response, uh, a specific piece of legislation has been enacted for this. I will move to Turkey in this regard. For instance, Turkish data protection law follows the, G, uh, not the GDPR, the, the famous 9546. And when you compare sensitive data category within this piece of legislation, the Turkish law have clothing as a sensitive data category. When you uh, compare this data to look to the original uh, uh, text of uh, 9546, you don't see clothing as a uh, distinct uh, sensitive data. This is also a unique uh, to Turkey, as it's a cultural, it's a historical, it's a political issue. People have been uh, profiled according to their headscarf, uh, so that there has been uh, this has been used. The clothing of people have been used as a ground uh, of discrimination, so that we see that unique uh, some uh, legislations have unique uh, kind of interpretation of privacy and uh, categories of uh, uh, data on the ground of certain cultural, historical, or political event. So I'm also closing this part of my uh, uh, presentation. And then I'm moving to internet law. Uh, and I will finish up. I don't have too many items to, to throw up to my soup. Uh, I promise that I will uh, finish with two examples. Uh, by the way, what's happening in terms of internet law uh, uh, and the correlation between internet law and data protection? This year has been a very interesting year. Uh, there has been three different uh, court judges of European Union's decisions. Two of them were, were related uh, to right to be forgotten. On the other hand, one uh, decision was related uh, about uh, tackling, uh, combating illegal content. The decision of 
3 October 2019. Uh, within these pieces of legislations, also we see that a very hot topic, uh, territorial scope issue, has been uh, re-analyzed, uh, uh, scrutinized by the Court Justice of the European Union, and we have a very near road, uh, and we a crossroad. Within this crossroad, the Court Justice of the European Union uh, held that if it is about right to be forgotten, it should remain local. You cannot delist de uh, the results from the global indexes. You, should, uh, you are bound by the European domains. On the other hand, uh, it's an interesting case, the third case that I have mentioned, the uh, one that has been rendered at uh, October 2019. The Court Justice of the European Union held that uh, the decision when it comes to illegal content, uh, it doesn't prevent member states uh, or the courts to render decisions that can uh, end up uh, deleting the content uh, at international uh, level. So we are, I think, uh, uh, we will talk about the territorial scope uh, in terms of internet law, which also have uh, some outcomes in terms of data protection and privacy for a very long time. I'm finishing with uh, adding the last the salt and uh, some pepper to my soup, uh, which is uh, there is an ongoing process of reforming Council of Europe Cyber Crime Convention, and we will have uh, within perhaps this year, perhaps one, uh, with, within a few years' time, a very new cyber uh, crimes uh, protocol. Within this protocol, also, uh, there is an ongoing uh, process for uh, synchronizing the cyber crime arena with data protection and privacy, privacy particularly when it comes to uh, requesting data uh, of from uh, service providers and meta metadata and content data. So I'm ending up here. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, it, I hope that you like the soup. It, as I mentioned, it's totally up to you to connect the dots or forget about this. Have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>
So I think when I'm talking about user control, I think there's two ways of understanding user control. You can involve people when they are using these systems and when these systems or when they are subjected to the systems that I've been talking about, but I've, I think this also applies to other AI systems or algorithms. So you can involve uh, people on an individual basis, but I think there should also be ways to involve people on a collective basis. And uh, something that I've always think of is in Germany, uh, it's part of the media regulation that public service media and also other uh, me uh, media organizations have to have a kind of board in, on which people from different societal groups are being represented, and these uh, representative boards uh, are ensured to create diversity in how systems, um, when it comes to the determination of what content is being broadcasted and um, uh, at what time slots and so on, that these systems are being taken in some kind of democratic way. And I think that this could be like, if it, it, it has been working for many years in Germany in the public uh, or in the broadcasting sector, and I think we could envision something similar, at least it could inspire similar approaches uh, for tech companies or other kind of big organizations that employ these um, technologies. So um, individual, individual control, but also uh, sorts of collective control um, involving different groups of society on a managerial level. Go ahead. Too kind. Um, I have a question also for Sarah. Uh, maybe it's a two-part question. So um, you talk about privacy and how we should have, I guess, the ability to uh, delete our data or to be forgotten. Um, and I wonder what does it mean when tech companies can keep what they've learned about us? So if, if you delete my picture and my text, that's fine, but the company still has that mind intelligence that it's already learned from my pictures and my data. And then it joins this bigger model and I cannot selectively say erase that part as well. So um, sh sh can we go further in asking to be deleted or should we not even be included in that system? And I guess the other part is just for um, uh, everyone else um, on the panel. Um, well, I don't think, okay, just that question and then I'll keep someone else <laughs> while I process it. So that is a great question. What you're basically asking is how can we enforce the right to be forgotten or the right to erasure um, when we consider that once you, sub once you give up your data, it's not being used to um, make decisions about you. It's also being used to uh, develop these kind of models and via which other people are also implicated. And this question has been flagged by a couple of researchers, but no one has really answered it yet. I am also, I'm neither able to answer a question because it really goes to how we envision data protection rights and privacy rights and how these systems actually use. So data protection really sees um, kind of assumes that data processing systems are quite linear and divided in really specific steps that we can target with specific rights and that we can exercise on an individual basis. And I think your question perfectly shows how this assumption is, is just so wrong on, on, on certain levels. And I think we really, like, I don't want to suggest that we should rethink data protection law right now because we have the GDPR and as was mentioned earlier, we should work with it for a few years. But um, at the same time, I think we also have to think about how we can um, think of other data protection approaches that are more suited for um, yeah, how these technological systems work and also how organizations work if we think about agile design and so on. It's not as if a product is just being developed and then launched on the market and then it's finished. Also after product launch on the market and after people buy it, a product is constantly being, being revised and being, it, it, you have updates on your phone and so on. Um, so this only further complicates the situation, but it's a great uh, question to think of for the next few years. May I? Maybe. Uh, uh, Thanks again for your awesome presentations. Just a, a quick line, Brent, if, if after deleting the data, the system is still able to make inferences about you, you wouldn't probably want to read Brent Mitterstadt, who was here in Istanbul for, for the yeah. last year. And suppose, Brent Mitterstadt, piece on the rights to reasonable inferences. This is a, nice, a very interesting piece. 
my, my own question is very boring, but I, I feel like it's necessary to ask it because over the, over the course of the past two days, which is the time I've been flying from Brazil here, right, so I didn't know about it until now, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced that he, the, the position for algorithms management and policy officer in the city of New York is open. So I think in 2015, uh, Andrew Tutt, who was a lawyer for the Department of Commerce under the Obama administration, had managed to suggest an FDA for algorithms. It never got out of the paper. It seems now it's, it's, something is going to happen. There's going to be a policy position in the US that is going to deal about, with things that you were all mentioning. Suppose you're, you're taking that office. What, what would be ways forward for you to start in each of, of the domains that, uh, that you mentioned here, what, are, what would be the ways for, what would a person like that need to do day one? Can you give us a, a rundown for what the position is? Uh -huh. <laughs> I've just read the, it's not that I want to apply to it, I, I don't even know. <laughs> the, no, no, I just, I've just seen the title of the position, it's Algorithms uh, Management and Policy Officer. I, um, I'm, not, I'm not really sure what the position is there too, but uh, I, I guess it's going to be someone that's going to try to oversee and maybe uh, diminish the problems that rise from the indiscriminate use of algorithms for decision making in sensitive, in the most sensitive areas. I think if there exists such a position, the very first step should be uh, incorporating stakeholders to the uh, uh, decision-making process, making the coordination and having a harmony in terms of different stakeholders, uh, the technical aspects and policy aspects are represented and have their say in a coordinated way. So I think that this will create, uh, uh, avoid at least the defragmentation of uh, the uh, overall uh, uh, process. And uh, aside uh, from this, uh, this uh, kind of uh, what's called post uh, also uh, could be used uh, for, you know, as, as a uh, there is a theory uh, in inter international law. In the most of the cases, states use soft law uh, documents. Uh, the theory is commitment phobia, which means that uh, states refrain from making uh, concrete uh, commitments, binding commitments. Instead of this, they uh, lay down some soft law documents, but in the course of time, this soft law evolves into the law. Uh, there are uh, really interesting examples of this, and I think this could be an area about, uh, uh, you know, you will conduct and you need to conduct an empirical analysis in order to understand what's keeping going on a specific sector, but this kind of uh, department post could uh, have an update, uh, overlook, outlook of what's uh, the current uh, situation and it can lead up, at least uh, diminish the administrative uh, cost of uh, having, you know, running the very same project conducting the very same empirical analysis and uh, could create some kind of soft law documents uh, that would lay down the seeds uh, for uh, perhaps uh, binding uh, documents in the course of time or could be a regulatory impact assessment role that will coordinate uh, at least lay down the principles of uh, when we should conduct impact assessment. So, uh, depends on the salary. If the salary is low, it will do just much stakeholder participation. <laughs> if it's high, it will be some more executive uh, uh, role. Thank you so much. Whether this is for private sector, for, for uh, policy, or if it's using, if it's focusing on uh, how algorithms are used in public se sector, which I actually don't know how Office of the of the mayor of the city of New York, but it depends on how, how it's being used. Um, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. However, using universal design to make sure that these programs work for people who are most vulnerable uh, is probably a good way to go. That's my answer. I think what I would like to add is multi-stakeholderism and including stakeholders is such a sweet word, and it is perfect if it works, but from a children's standpoint, point of view, I would say that we need 
brave new children in the brave new world we live in. We need to make them strong and thrive in this wild west tech world that we're approaching because we cannot get everything right. Like how? Like we are facing these technologies that we have no idea about day by day. We might, we might screw up at some point, but we need those young people get stronger and thrive in that all this ambiguity and, you know, be strong. <laughs> So, quick answer. Um, assuming that this would be a function just focused on the public sector, what I know, at least from the Netherlands, is what happens is that a lot of local public bodies are using or experimenting with all kinds of AI systems, but they really don't know of each other what, who is doing what. And also on a central governmental level, there's like no overview. So I would suggest that such a manager really starts with like mapping out all the different initiatives that happen all across different public sector levels and um, start from there with other uh, yeah, new projects. Sorry to keep taking up everyone's time, um, but to sort of go back a little bit into power inequalities, um, often marginalized groups don't have the power to signal their interests or their protections, and so um, therefore companies or governments or institutions do not respond accordingly to their interests. Uh, so I'm wondering then, should, in order to bring about actual change, should we make um, the conversation be about how technology affects the elite, as what Johnny was saying, how they suffer, how those who have power suffer, in order for companies to act, uh, to respond to those people who can uh, economically or politically signal their protections. Uh, so how do we force that change if that's not the way to do it? I guess that your question also speaks to uh, the earlier discussion about intellectual privacy and involving different societal groups. So I see your issue with um, usually uh, marginalized groups not being heard. And so there, that, that's something that we should address, right? Give them a place via these diversity boards, for example, and um, not just, yeah, oblige organizations to have people from different groups representing themselves within these organizations. And I, I see an immediate response, <laughs> please. Sorry. Um, I think on the one hand, I agree with you, and on the one hand, I see this as a practical approach. On the other hand, I want to give you the 1980s feminist argument, mm -hmm. which is, that's not my job. Yeah. Okay, and I think that is, I think, the problem where we're having, because we're putting the emotional labor on the marginalized groups, we're putting the political labor on the marginalized groups. And I think where we, and this is the most important issue that people like me have with user control as a, as a political and a legal strategy. We are putting the labor onto the group of people that are actually affected by it. And as much as I'd love to have the brave new kids, and I'm, I've got great hopes for Gen Z, I can't wait for them to actually come to university because they're kick-ass. But, but I think what we need to start looking at is the structural approach of making the legislation, the legislator, the political power responsible for identifying and recognizing where it needs to become active mm -hmm. and do not, not to make this depending on whether or not those that need protection have a voice. And I think therein lies the problem that we're currently having. And user control and, and, and user ways of making their, their needs known is not going to happen because the majority of time they do not actually have that voice in the first place. So I think we need structures, we need procedures, we need a much more of a different bureaucratic approach. And this is why I loved your talk earlier so much, because I actually think, again, in the 80s, we used to say, I don't want to have a, a seat on the table. I want to throw the table over. And I think we need to get there at some stage with regard to data protection. And I don't want to come across as a revolutionary, but really, we're getting to a point where everything else has failed. 
And if we don't re necessarily start thinking about somewhat more radical strategies, I think we're getting to the tipping point where maybe we've missed the boat, and then really we can all start thinking about what the future holds, because the children is not going to be the one, you know, the future at that point in time. I think we couldn't have a more beautiful uh, ending, closing for this session. Really, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Nothing else to say. Last words from the IT Love team. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, your creations, imaginations, your contributions, your opinion, your questions. And thank you very much um, for all of our speakers and moderators. Um, I call today, as it's sort of a festival of ideas, really. I really enjoy it, and I really um, uh, learned a lot uh, from all of you. Um, hope to see you uh, next year for the third edition of the Istanbul Privacy Symposium. And uh, thank you so much again and take care. Thank you. I, I would like to have a particular thank to all of our heroes who made this day possible. Thank you to the technical team, YouTube team just over there. <laughs> Uh, our Dogma team, the catering team, they are also around there. Thank you. All administrative staff, we are really grateful to them. And of course, students, uh, they were so commit uh, committed to this day, making this day possible. Thank you for everyone who have contributed to this event. Thanks for our guests. Thanks for our first speakers. Uh, have a nice evening. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, we forget Elif and Aisha. They are from the family. And from Natalia. the family and, and Natalia, Natalia. And yes. Yoga. Elif and Aisha created that uh, symposium, really. Sorry. Thank you. Natalia, thank you so much. Thank you.